So did you hear from Jesse Waters' mom after the fact? She... No, but I, yeah, I did end by saying, tell your mom I said <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's a fun line. Yeah. It's very Boston. Very Boston. <laughs> yeah, you, you put me on set of Fox for 10 minutes, suddenly the Boston comes well, out. Well, Mrs. Waters, if you're listening... Um, please come out of the pod. Please come out of the pod. We would you. love to have you. I'm John Favreau. I'm Max Fisher. Welcome to Offline. Max, have you by chance been hankering to watch an impromptu debate... Between the My Pillow CEO and a child. Why do you think I showed up today? I the promise say, of this clip is why I'm here. You have come to the right place. <laughs> uh, we will get to that extremely online moment in a bit, but before we do, you and I have lots of news to cover. So no mm-hmm. guest today, just us. Just us, just Gavin. Just, just the Gavin. Gals. Uh, we're going to talk about Mark Zuckerberg's new effort to suck up to Republicans, keep Meta out of the election. And maybe keep himself out of jail if Trump wins. <laughs> Find out. We're also going to touch on why Trump's latest endorsements from RFK Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard may suggest a larger political realignment of anti-establishment internet cranks mm-hmm. versus center-left and center-right institutionalists. But first, we have survived a very sleep-deprived but successful <laughs> Democratic convention. Uh, and uh, it's been a week since Kamala Harris accepted the nomination in Chicago, but wanted to spend some time talking today about some of the very offline-worthy moments mm-hmm. at the DNC. Mm-hmm. It was very, it was very online DNC, which is to say very offline. Yes, and I will say I, I was there all week. Mm-hmm. I was somewhat offline at the DNC. Really, your screen time numbers were down. My That's great. screen time numbers plummeted <laughs> because I had no time to check my phone. So the secret to your screen time is just to keep you so locked into events. The secret to keep your screen time numbers down just keep you on Fox News. The- <laughs> That's the one time apparently you won't be looking on your phone. That I was, was not. Why Austin told me that's actually why they put you on Jesse Waters. Just to keep me like, offline. Just to get those numbers down. Yeah, it's six minutes. You're not on your phone. Honestly, it worked. I think it was like <laughs> one hour a day. Was it really wild? How'd you feel? I. F- I mean, I felt tired. <laughs> sure. Okay, fair. <laughs> I felt tired and uninformed. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, so anyway, we got to start. So I missed this whole clip for that we're about to play. Mm. Uh, this is an Austin favorite. He basically <laughs> ordered us to do I this. Uh, it's a clip of my pillow CEO, Mike Lindell, who apparently shaved his mustache in an unsuccessful effort to disguise himself at I, the DNC. It, it, fo- it fooled me. I had no idea who it was. I said, who's this normal-looking, completely <laughs> sane person? Nope, it was Mike Lindell. <laughs> uh, and he was trying to debate a 12-year-old influencer. Take it away, Austin. You want to know more in your state? So they just found 250, 257,000 votes. This happened last week. A judge ruled in Georgia that are missing. From the 2020 election. Oh, yeah. This so just source. came out. You're behind you, so shouldn't you? So your source is Trust Me, bro? That's your source? No, you the source, no, the source. source, it's in your papers in Georgia. You need to read you your news. You haven't given me any you last name. You need to read yeah. your news. No, this is your Georgia news. Wow. Yeah, so I can't own this ass. <laughs> People are ready for it. <laughs> so Lindell's fight with a child was just one of many moments where right-wing content creators and grifters infiltrated the DNC and attempted to instigate some sort of fight with the event's attendees. (laughs) Matt Walsh put on a wig and a new pair of glasses to promote his new documentary (laughs) titled Am I Racist? Cool. Asked and answered. Charlie (laughs) Charlie Cook was also looking for trouble. Uh, But the best he could do was a verbal spat with the president of the Young Democrats of Georgia, who I think comported himself well. So none of us who were at the RNC in Milwaukee, Uh and by us I mean both your friendly neighborhood Pod Save America hosts mm-hmm. and progressive content creators at large. Um, none of us felt compelled to don disguises and infiltrate the RNC. Uh-huh. Uh, do you think a potentially viral moment has value for all these right-wing <laughs> goobers? And also, I mean, this isn't very offline, but like, what are your thoughts on the disguises? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, I think that it's a little messed up for you to blame Mike Lindell for the fact that you guys did not think to do this first. <laughs> Like, like, look, uh, innovators get credit. Although, what would the disguises even be? Like, what are we thinking? Like a little rouge to look extremely beet red? I mean, we didn't want to be recognized because we were a little frightened by all those, <laughs> yeah. by all the folks it would at the be RNC. Scary. Yeah. And so I, we never went into the convention. We were like standing right outside the convention mm-hmm. and reporters were walking in and a couple of reporters were like, oh, hey, Pod Save America. And we were like, shh, <laughs> don't tell them. Don't tell. Yeah. But there was one group of people we were walking with mm-hmm. and we asked them like, who do you think... Who are you most nervous about um, uh, replacing Joe Biden? Okay. Because this is right before the Joe Biden yeah. thing. And they, and said they Joe were from Biden. Pennsylvania, so yeah. they said Josh Shapiro, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. And we hadn't said yeah. who we were at the time because uh-huh. we wanted a real conversation. And love, it's like, 
we're on the other team, by the way. <laughs> cool. Because he didn't. He, he was like, I don't want to just leave Trick them people. thinking. Yeah, that's that true. we're yeah. not yeah. who we are, yeah. right? And I was like, well, we don't want to have to lie to people, but we can at least get them to talk to us by not. Sure. Starting with that, yeah, yeah, but yeah, so that's our that was that's just a contrast <laughs> what these fucking losers did, <laughs> right? I mean, I think that I think that your question is like, what do they actually get out of this? Mm. Speaks to the perverse incentives here. That it's obviously if you are a right wing content creator, it's good for you to like go get your viral moment, selectively edit it to make the twelve year old look like, yeah, you owned his ass. Okay, great, congratulations. So you get some more views on your platform, mm. but that's not actually good for the Republican Party, <laughs> no. and that's and that like. Normally that would be fine, except that these people who you mentioned, these are big figures in the party, right? Like Charlie Kirk spoke at the RNC. Mike Lindell ran to be the Republican National Committee chair. Mm. And so these people are just like, like a oh. co-conspirator. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so I think that this is another indicator of how much the party, the Republican Party, has been captured by its own online fringes. That these people who are like visible faces of it are going and doing something that makes them look like weird, like inward looking internet crazy people which they are and it's just like we should talk about like i think this show is going to kind of broadly be about like what does it mean for a political party to be too online or like what yeah. is the appropriate amount of online for a political party to be in today's like internet social media era and i think that this was an asset for the republican party in 2016 because it helped them ride this wave of grassroots far right totally terrifying enthusiasm and now it's become a big liability because they are in hock to these people who were just out for a viral moment and those people are like firmly ensconced in their own bubble yes. and have completely believed the caricatures of us mm -hmm. that they have created right which is why when you look at some of these videos they're all so surprised <laughs> you know by like That's the true, people right? they're you talking do to like charlie kirk was sort of surprised by the the right. kid who was the president of young democrats of georgia right. and um, like he didn't have anything else to say, so he was just like, "Hey, what is a woman? What is <laughs> a woman?" I saw that. I saw and that. He's like, it's "You know, what, come on." And he's like, do, "What? What? Do you know what a woman? You should meet one or something." Like, I'm yeah. married to one. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm married to one too." Yeah, I thought the responses to that were great, and yes, it did speak to the fact that they don't have an actual line for speaking to actual Democrats because they don't know what one is, and also it's just like these videos are speaking to the most like inner, inner, inner base of the online far right. It's not like you're not. Not winning any votes by speaking to those people because they were already going to vote Republican or they weren't going to vote because they think that the polls are rigged. But that's a huge difference, too, is that they are not the strategy here. There is no political strategy. Right. It's just what's in it for them. Yeah. Right. And yeah. we have talked before about how sometimes on the far left mm -hmm. on our side, there's like there could be more strategy sure. involved. Sure. But like. Let's be clear. Most of the Republican Party <laughs> is currently operating with no strategy to earn the votes of most Americans. No, but a great strategy to sell Trump's latest NFTs. Or right. what was it? His, his baseball cards there's, or something? Yeah, there's there's something trading he's cards hawking. Or something. Right. Um, but they, they're there for the viral moments mm -hmm. and to own the lips. I right. guess the only strategy is owning the lips. Like if you can make right. um, a liberal seem angry mm -hmm. or upset or offended mm -hmm. or you know cry harder live kind of thing <laughs> like this is what makes mm -hmm. them happy mm -hmm. this is like a victory for them and the the this year's rnc and dnc i thought were a really telling contrast between what it looks like to have a strong party versus a weak party and like that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that like you have to agree with or like every decision that the democrats made at the dnc but it was very clear that the the operating, like, guiding agenda and strategy for the DNC going into it was acting as, like, strong party institutions for what do we think is the best interest of the party going into the election. Mm. And it's very clear looking at the RNC that it's just, like, a bunch of people just kind of, like, grabbing stuff to, like, what's going to be a good moment for Hulk Hogan. It like, people have, like, disparate agendas. Everybody fucking hates J.D. Vance, the vice yeah. presidential candidate. And it's, like, completely fractious. It's, like, kind of a personality cult for the personal enrichment of Trump, although he's not showing up. So so it's just totally rudderless now. And when you see these like major figures in the party going out and recording these videos that are going to alienate a lot of people, mm -hmm. I think it really speaks to that. And it also speaks to like they can't get a moment because the like overwhelming message from the Democrats and the DNC, which, again, is a very like strong party, like top down decision is like broad inoffensive acceptable to everyone let's be joyful let's like have a positive uplifting message and that's very hard to do a like reverse polarization far right video about aren't you so outraged that kamala is joyful well you mentioned um 
my appearance on Jesse Waters program. <laughs> uh, so what happened there is uh-huh. we were in our little studio space, okay, and uh, got a knock on the door, and and two of Jesse Waters' producers said, "Hey, um, we all know about the pod, and Jesse would love for you to come on the show. His okay. mom likes the show, <laughs> and so it was me and Pfeiffer. And she's Pfeiffer. a big lib, right? Yeah, she's a big lib. So it was, it was me and Pfeiffer, and." Um, and Dan immediately just left the conversation to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and so it was just me. And I mean, they're like, Would, could you come on in 30 minutes? And I was like, uh, I don't, I mean, this is not a no, but I'm mm-hmm. just going to think about it. Sure. So here's Austin's email. <laughs> That's perfect. Just to it, have the deflection. That's why right, we have. But then I, then I was like talking to Austin and Madeline and all of our stuff mm-hmm. there. And I was like, should I, I, I kind of think I should do this. But mm-hmm. my view of why it was valuable to do mm-hmm. was not to let, like Dan was like, you should, you should think about like, what you want to accomplish here, you sure. know? Right. right. And I was like, that's a good point. And I think what I want to accomplish is, you know, sort of what Pete Buttigieg says when he goes on Fox, mm-hmm. right? Which is like, there are people watching Fox mm-hmm. who are not necessarily like, they're not all Trump fans or sure. Trump hard, hardcore Trump fans. Sure. They have and, it on. Right. And like, wouldn't it be nice to expose those people to an argument based in fact mm-hmm. um, that can rebut some of the bullshit you, that you hear on right. Fox News? Right. And, and the, to your point, to show that the what the actual Democrats look like is different than the like three eyed boogeyman you've heard about on the network. Absolutely. And I didn't really have much time to think beyond that. But <laughs> my last thought is I was <laughs> thrown onto that studio. Um, it was like they want to have a Democrat on mm-hmm. who gets angry. I'm sure. And I'm who, sure that's who what seems they want. offended. Right. And who is like waving around, yelling, yeah, and, right, and right. Get, getting into the 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 mud with them. Right. And I was like, I'm not going to give them that. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to like laugh and smile through right. it. And, and then just, just like talk yeah. about the facts as I know them. What was their, what was their line that they said to try to, or did they have the a whole thing? The whole, like his whole, wa- he had this intro that was just like, <laughs> you know, uh, Kamala, Joe, they, they did a coup on Joe Biden with the, the Obamas <laughs> did. And now Kamala's <laughs> flying the plane, but she's going to crash it. Blah, blah blah. And then he was like, what'd you think of my intro? You're a speechwriter. And I was like, I don't know. It's okay, hard to follow. Sure. <laughs> That's my, <laughs> Like, what are you doing? So and he did you, seem a, he did seem slightly annoyed by the end I'm because sure. I wouldn't. You weren't you weren't getting into it. Yeah, that is no. their whole right. It was when they and you. Were, I feel like for years their strategy was like get Democrats and like left leaning journalists on to fight with them, and you could see them just like because people would see this game and stop going on, so they were just going for like with like random bloggers because they couldn't get anyone else to come on. Yeah. Um, I When I published my book, the publicist for the publishing company really wanted me to do exactly the thing that you wisely chose not to do. They really wanted me. They were like, can you go on to Fox News and really get into a big fight with them and like really own them? And we really think that'll help sell the book. Because Reza <laughs> Aslan, had, I don't even remember this. He had done this. Who did? This Reza Aslan oh, is an oh. author. He wrote a book yeah, about yeah, yeah. the history of Islam. It's a great book. I didn't and know he, he did that though. It was it was like ten years ago. It was okay. like the height of the Islamophobia stuff around like 2014, 2015. And there was some daytime host that asked us some leading question about like, oh, don't you think Muslims are bad? Is something horrible? And he just like had this great rant, and they didn't have an answer for it. And my publicist was like, you should do that. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> I don't think that sounds fun or like a good use of time because it's that's what they want. They that's, do they, want that. they want you to play that game. Game. Yep. Yeah. Um, they want. They want like you know, Max Fisher destroyed by uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. Because they they have they control the studio. They control the environment. They control the edit. So did you hear from Jesse Waters' mom after the fact? She... No, but I yeah that, I did end by saying tell your mom I said. <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's a fun line. Yeah. It's very Boston. Very Boston. <laughs> it was the yeah you you put me on set of Fox for ten minutes suddenly the Boston comes. Well, out. Well, Mrs. Waters, if you're listening, um, please come onto the pod. Please come onto the pod. We would you. love to have you. Yeah. Um, in brighter DNC news, um, <laughs> this up and comer named Barack Obama took the stage on Tuesday night. And, I, I heard about this. <laughs> and he delivered a speech that at times sounded like he was sitting right here in this <laughs> studio recording an <laughs> offline episode. Let's play a clip. We live in a time of such confusion and rancor with a culture that puts a premium on things that don't last. Money, fame, status, likes. We chase the approval of strangers on our phones. We build all manner of walls and fences around ourselves, and then we wonder why we feel so alone. We don't trust each other as much because we don't take the time to know each other. And in that space between us, politicians and algorithms teach us to caricature each other, 
and troll each other and fear each other. I mean, I mean, he's right. He's fucking right, and he should say it. What was your reaction when you first heard that? So I was. Watching- I did not. I did not tell you guys in advance. I did. I, I helped with the speech. It was. Quite I knew a it surprise. was coming. It was. It final draft. I was like, okay, here it is. It it's, it's happening. It was a fun. So I was sitting at home watching it with Julia, and I had to slap myself because I was like, wait, am I in a recording right now? Is it Friday morning, and I'm in a recording and like blacked out somehow, and like I'm hallucinating? I was like, clearly this is just Favreau sitting across from me saying this because it really did sound like an episode of our show yeah you know it did it so so how how first, hard did you have to work to get him to say the word algorithm he he included the word algorithm Come on. i did not write the word algorithm at all <laughs> so i swear funny. to god no but we um he and i had a conversation about the speech like uh right around the time that that um biden uh, mm-hmm. dropped out because he was thinking about it really that, far in that early yeah wow. um and he, the conversation we had or Sorry, the conversation we had included, uh, you know, a part where we were talking about the appeal of authoritarianism Mm -hmm. and the appeal of Trump and like why it has lasted and what we're doing. And we started having this longer conversation about Mm -hmm. social media and not Mm -hmm. knowing each other. And and it's it's interesting because it's his point is much broader than the disinformation and content moderation stuff that we talk about on here, too. Yeah, it's much more of the sort of the loneliness, social alienation Mm -hmm. Uh, topics that we've covered with, you know, Vic Murthy and mm-hmm. a whole bunch of other people on here, mm-hmm. and he's very, he's very taken with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and just listening to that when he said money, fame, status, you know, he, there's likes at the end, right. but money, fame, and status, mm-hmm. he has been talking about that, like chasing the wrong things, That's true. and what we value for years. Right. Like I remember writing, you know, commencement speeches for him where he mm-hmm. would go on that riff. So it's very interesting mm-hmm. that he has like updated that view for the social media era. Not right. really updated, but at least realized and, and very much believes yeah. that social media is contributing right. to um, all of these problems and making democracy much harder. I mean, he has been the like part of this that was that was not surprising here is that he has really been ahead of the curve on this issue, on the influence of social media and the malign influence of social media, like way ahead of everybody, including ahead of me. Like he was talking about it in the immediate days after Trump won the election in 2016. He gave a big speech, not a, specifically about it, but he gave a speech in Chicago in January 2017 where he talked a lot about it. And the reaction at the time was like, oh, this is kind of blaming social media because the Democrats lost and how could a social media algorithm actually have that much of an impact? Yeah. And so he was like really going out on a limb to make this case. And then, of course, the rest of us caught up to it. And yeah. the rest of us ha- like very much have come around to this point of view. So it was interesting to hear both to both to be reminded that this is something that he has cared about for a long time and to hear him kind of like circle back on it eight years later and to hear the degree to which he's updated these views. Like clearly he is continuing to follow this issue. Like this is a guy who has thoughts on smartphone bans in elementary schools. Oh, for sure. And, you know, a lot of reporting sort of uses the facile frame that's like, oh, he... uh, the internet guy who you know who used <laughs> Facebook to help win an election suddenly doesn't like the internet, you know. Sure. And Obama has addressed that. I think we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. But when we interviewed him in Chicago, and he said, "Look, the whole deal with Facebook was we would connect people right. uh, during the 08 Obama campaign so that they could meet up in real life offline." Right. right. <laughs> and it was an organizing tool, but organizing has to happen in person. Yeah. And the, I think the reason he's so concerned about this is because of his background as a community organizer. Oh, I see. Is that he genuinely believes that social media is interrupting that process? Yeah, that collective yeah. action is important. In the way right. that we have coll- the way that we uh, mm-hmm. collective action happens is if we get to know each other, right. and the only way we get to know each other is if we're in person mm-hmm. and we go back and forth, and that's how disagreements are solved too. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. the, everything that we're seeing now is just mm-hmm. making all of that much harder. Right. I mean, we've talked a lot about how social media platforms have mm-hmm. displaced what used to be the way that we would gather, you know, at church, your local community, going down to the bar or whatever, that mm-hmm. now you go online instead. And that's an experience that's manipulated and it's not real. And it's mediated through these algorithms that are lying to you about what's actually happening in your community to make you more outraged, make you more insular, make your opinions more extreme. And I think it's good that he reminds 
reminded people of that. Like, yeah. you know, I, I did appreciate that he turned into the camera and directly addressed this podcast and the listeners of this podcast. I thought that that was very kind of him. To give yeah. us a shout out. Um, he should have done ad read too, to he be should, honest. Yeah. yeah, I should have talked about the shoes or something. Should have talked about, yeah, Z-Biotics if you're going out tonight. <laughs> um, no, the, <laughs> I think the, the question I always have is like, can he move the needle on this on this stuff? Mm-hmm. Because he's given speeches on this before. Right. It's a little it's a little fuzzier than specific policies could fix. Sure. Right. Which right. is you know a theme of this podcast. Right. right? <laughs> but so it, I, it's good that he does it in a speech that more people are going to see than most of his right. other speeches. Yeah. Um, I don't really know what he does from there except just continue to raise awareness. About I mean, it. I think it's useful for two reasons. I think it's useful number one because like it. It is true that most of us have caught up with this point of view now, and most of us agree that social media is a malign and nefarious influence in our society, even as we continue to use it, because what kind of alternatives do we have? But I do think that kind of public awareness around the dangers of social media kind of crested with January 6th and Mm -hmm. with 2021. And it's like as time moves on, it's like harder to reconnect with that. And it's just so pervasive that it's very easy to lose touch with the fact that we have giant companies that every single day manipulate billions of people, billions of people to be more polarized, excuse me, to be more polarized, to be more extreme, to believe misinformation, angrier, angrier, right, that it's spreading health misinformation as we speak in this very moment. It's just because it's everywhere. It's so easy to forget about it. It's so easy to forget about what a big problem it is. And having someone who is a like publicly trusted figure remind you like, hey, this is still a live issue, I think is useful. Yeah. There's also like the political science nerd in me is like thinks that the like intra elite signaling really matters where there's, you know, yeah, the is. actual policy making around this issue, because unfortunately, it's almost certainly not going to go through Congress is going to be decided by like 200 people at the FTC and the SEC. But all of them watch that speech. All of them know the entire party watched that speech and cheered for it. So that's very helpful for creating kind of party consensus that like, this is still a really big issue. It's the stakes are really high and we have to do something about it. And- We'd have to fact check this, but it may have been the only speech at the Democratic convention that mentioned the word algorithm. I, I feel from pretty the confident. President of the United Without States. running a search, I feel pretty confident yeah. it was the only one mentioning algorithms. Uh, all right. One last bit from the DNC. On Thursday, there was a vicious viral disinformation campaign that targeted those of us who were fans of Taylor Swift and or Beyonce, arguably, arguably the world's two biggest pop stars. Um, early in the day, rumors began to circulate online from an anonymous mm-hmm. resistance Twitter account that for some reason more than half a million people follow. Uh, They tweeted the DNC viewers should expect a surprise guest, quote, bigger than Oprah. (laughs) Then other resistance accounts said that Beyonce had been spotted in Chicago Mm -hmm. and even at the United Center. And then all hell broke loose when TMZ (laughs) published an article claiming that Beyonce would perform. Of course, none of this came to pass. Um, so if you all want a, a full blown investigation of this incident, <laughs> I did one this week. Really? On our subscriber only show, Terminally Online. Okay. Uh, yes, I did. It was an oral <laughs> history of what happened. How uh, how much tape did we did we dedicate to this? I did it. I mean, look, I got. Uh, I think I got a five. Okay. So I was, okay. I was terminally nice. online. I love that. Which. Is good for that show, less good for this show. <laughs> what would you say your average is on Terminally Online? It's up to it's up to four or five. Okay, yeah, okay. usually me and Elijah. Half, are, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Um, but here on Offline, <laughs> let's talk about why so many Democrats, journalists, even convention staffers, mm-hmm. fell for this one. I mean, it's the unholy trifecta of social media decentralized. Um, TMZ and resistance accounts. You should trust <laughs> none of those three. Those should be at the bottom of your list of sources that you trust ever. What was the angry staffer account? Angry staffer. Honestly, account. fuck that account. Like Purports it just to be like don't... a former White House staffer in the Trump years that was yes. always telling us like it's total Trump's bullshit. throwing spaghetti at the wall. Uh, he's so mad. And, and it was always <laughs> like he's just about to his downfall is coming. It's yeah, imminent. Yeah. The, like the forces are. It's real. It's blue and on. But yet like. 600,000 followers. I know. These accounts persist. It's because it's reassuring because people like to. OK, so my actual take on yeah. this, like on the one hand, it's like classic misinformation where there's like a kernel of truth where delegates really had been told. My understanding is really had been told like there's going to be a surprise musical guest. That's at least what I heard. I have a family member who's a North Carolina delegate. And like, that's what she said. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess pink. I think it was. Pink. I guess pink was yes. not announced till that day. Something like but that. But when the rumors were flying. No, we already was, knew that pink was it pink, was, and the chicks were performing. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I but I do I think there's a deeper thing going on here, which is that I think that this is kind of part of the 
continuing high that we have all felt on the left from like Biden dropping out, mm. Kamala coming mm. in, Tim Walls gets picked as the VP. He's the like online favorite by a wide margin. Like it really kind of felt like Santa Claus is coming every day and we're going to like yada yada a- yada election day win. Absolutely. History has 50 ended. State. Somehow Trump, she- goes to- Trump goes away. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> to the we Hague. We can all go back to brunch. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going back to brunch. <laughs> and it, it, it really did feel like we could ma- like whatever we wanted, we were going to get. It was all going to come true. Like we could manifest. I, think, and the, like, I do think that there was a inevitable crashing back down to earth that was going to happen and I think the like the goofy part of it is the Beyonce thing where we like we thought we could just manifest Beyonce being there by like tweeting about it a lot and it turns out that's not the case <laughs> but I think there was also Everyone's like it's like we manifested Kamala Harris being the nominee <laughs> that way I mean kind that did kind we of happen we manifested her running mate too <laughs> that did and all of which is I think there's some truth to it but there was going to be an inevitable and I think we saw this a little bit with the like uncommitted stuff are they going to get a speaking slot and like we don't have to get into the substance of that but it was just a moment of like waking back up to the reality of politics where like you're not going to like every decision that happens you're not everything is going to go your way not everything is going to go the way the online left or like not every musical guest is going to be Beyonce and there was just kind of like I think it was inevitable that we were going to have to come back down to the reality of this well and on that point like from a campaign perspective Mm -hmm. it actually would have been a bad political decision to Mm -hmm. have, I think, Beyonce Mm -hmm. or Taylor Swift perform. If you were going to have Beyonce or Taylor Swift, Uh you don't do it at the convention where everyone's watching already, particularly the convention on a Thursday night where your nominee has a really important speech to give because people need to understand who she is and what she stands for and what she's going to do. And if you knew that Taylor or Beyonce was going to endorse at some point Mm -hmm. save it because we don't we have the debate coming up and then we have like that's true two months till election day so Mm -hmm. i don't know how about you know taylor showing up in pennsylvania Uh, yeah i was her home state in october altoona yeah or or beyonce's you know like there's Mm -hmm. just there's so many other ways to do that yeah so that is the reality of politics right i also think um Gizmodo did a piece on this, and their subhead was the hardest disinformation to guard against is the disinformation you want to believe which yes. I think is very right. much right. the case here. There's always, there's a kernel of truth, which was the thing, you know, the mm-hmm. delegates had heard the rumor, the White House political director tweeted a B, which turned out to be a mistake. I yeah. don't know if I believe that. Uh, I think yeah, maybe well. she thought it was Beyonce <laughs> and thought it would be fun to to pile yeah. onto that. Yeah, I think it was less like, <clears throat> what I believe about that, and I don't, I haven't asked Emmy Ruiz about this, but like, I don't think it was like, her confirming it was her being like, She's I'm excited. putting it out there. Right. She's yeah. manifesting right. it too. Yeah. It's because we all thought we could do that. We right. But yes, I think you're right that a big part of it too is motivated reasoning, is you want to believe that thing that's true, which is a very powerful force. Like our brains are only so good at differentiating truths that we don't like from fuzzier truths that we do like. And like we're always really drawn to want to believe that, of course, it's going to be Beyonce. I believed it. And you know who really loves motivated reasoning? Beyonce. Uh, these clout chasing resistance yes. accounts. Right. Well, that's I mean, what they and and it's something to be aware of as like you know yes. just because the account gives you information you want to hear mm-hmm. and is on your side mm-hmm. of the uh, in politics right, right? right. Um, no especially some of them that are like that hide behind their anonymity right like yes. they are extremely thirsty for RTs mm-hmm. and engagements and mm-hmm. follows a lot of them pretend to be news mm-hmm. a lot of these had like. You know, the breaking in all caps, <laughs> little alarm emojis. Yeah, if you see breaking in all caps and there's not a, a URL at the end to a news organization, <laughs> that's misinformation and you shouldn't well, retweet it. And it's also like anyone has a fucking blue check now. Right. You know, right. thanks to Elon. Right. So it's just it is it's harder, but you should you should be most uh suspicious. Mm-hmm. Not when an account Mm -hmm. that you would not be prone to believe tweets out something, but an account that you are prone to believe. Yes, (laughs) that's right. That's That's when you really want to check your sources. Well, and the thing is, it's like the thing that I would really urge people to take away from this is it's easy to remember this when it's just a straight factual claim you see on Twitter. It's like angry staffer says Beyonce will perform. Like that's either true or not true. And you're Mm going to find out in a few hours when it is really hard, but really important to remember this is when it is someone making a claim that is more a matter of interpretation. Mm. That is a matter of like, you know, what do we actually think of the things that Kamala has said so far about Gaza, whatever. Yeah. Like, And the that is where it is so much easier for misinformation in the form of like omission, omission or, or context. Right. Misleading missing. portrayals um, yep. that that is. And, and that's 
everybody falls for it because your brain is really drawn to it. But it just like take a beat, especially if you see something that provokes a really strong emotional reaction in Mm -hmm. you, whether it's outrage or whether it's I'm so excited that Taylor Swift is performing at the DNC. That's when you need to like really check is like, is this information solid? Is it complete? Is my brain playing a trick on me? Yeah, no, that's great advice. Um, All right. We're going to take a quick break. But before we do, uh, we are very excited to share that the trailer for the new limited series Empire City, the untold origin story of the NYPD is here. From Wondery, Crooked Media, and Push Black, Empire City is a captivating eight-part series that uncovers the hidden history of one of the largest police forces in the world, the NYPD. Hosted by Peabody Award winner Chenjirai Kumanika, the show is an immersive window into pivotal moments in New York's past that form the foundation for today's policing, from its origins rooted in slavery to rival police gangs battling across the city to the everyday people who resisted every step of the way. As our society debates where policing is going, Empire City will tell you where the police came from. Follow Empire City and official Tribeca selection wherever you get your podcasts and listen everywhere on September 9th. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts to listen ad free. It's great. It's really good. It's fantastic. I really love it. We've been, you know, working on this project for a couple of years now and mm. so excited to see it out in the world. Uh Chenjirai is fantastic. It's just it's a great show. So it's check great it out. history too. It's just a fun yarn. Yeah. Um, also, you may have heard Vote Save America has set a big goal to reach 75,000 volunteer signups by National Voter Registration Day on September 17th. They're making progress, but still need about 25,000 volunteers to hit their goal, and they can't get there without you. Vote Save America is a one-stop shop for the most high-impact ways to make a difference right now to ensure progressive wins across the country in November. They support candidates in critical state races who know their communities inside and out, and who champion the Harris Walls ticket. So you can feel good knowing your volunteer hours help Democrats up and down the ballot. And if you've never volunteered before, don't stress. Vote Save America will walk you through it on weekly welcome calls and their office hours so you can volunteer with confidence. Go to votesaveamerica.com slash 2024 to sign up today. This message has been paid for by Vote Save America. You can learn more at votesaveamerica.com. And this ad has not been authorized by any candidate or candidates committee. So a few weeks ago, we talked about how Mark Zuckerberg praised Donald Trump as a, quote, badass for raising his fist after he was shot. I um, thought that was a little odd, even for Mark. Yeah, uh, it makes more sense now. Yeah, I say. who for some reason has also taken to dressing like a, a white rapper lately. <laughs> Very weird. Very weird. He's, I, he's, that, got, he's got a weird look these days. I have some feedback from Mark Zuckerberg, but I say if you want to do a visual relaunch, I say go for it. Okay. I think it's cool to reset your style. It's it wouldn't very, be my choice personally. Very but... odd. He looks very... Um, <laughs> anyway, this week, Zuck took his MAGA curious musings a step further when he sent a letter to House Judiciary Committee Chair Jim Jordan about the Biden administration's requests that Meta not promote COVID misinformation during the pandemic. Zuckerberg wrote, quote, I believe the government pressure was wrong, and I regret that we were not more outspoken about it. I feel strongly that we should not compromise our content standards due to pressure from any administration in either direction, and we're ready to push back if something like this happens again. On a completely related note, Politico (laughs) reports this week that in Trump's new coffee table book, worryingly titled Save America, uh, he Uh, accuses Zuckerberg of plotting against him in 2020 and says that if he does it again, he'll, quote, spend the rest of his life in prison. Yeah, it's pretty. It's in a photo caption, apparently, which is (laughs) deeply unhinged. Yes, there's like just a picture of him with Zuckerberg. And it's got this this, guy's going to prison. Yes, it's just a, a truly wild thing to put in your picture book. Uh, Max, let's start with Zuck's claim that the government wrongly pressured Meta in 2021. What do you think? So I went back and looked at my notes from 2020 because I was like actively reporting on what was going on in social media at that time. Like there's a whole chapter in the book about it. And it will shock you to hear that Mark Zuckerberg is lying. In (laughs) fact, what happened in the very early days of the pandemic is that Meta generally and Zuckerberg specifically made a really big show of soliciting government involvement. They solicited involvement from the U.N. They really sought this out. They said, we want to work with you. We want your help because we don't have the resources to flag everything. It's like, we'll make the final decision. But like anything that you can give us information about things that you think are bad or harmful, we like really want to work with you. We're going to give you data. This was part of their like, we're good now. We're one of the good ones now. And this narrative that he is spinning now of like, we were being pressured by the government is just, it's 
it is wholly baseless. It is wholly an invention that clearly has just a naked political incentive of, I, I think he's got two goals here. One is obviously just appeasing Trump or signaling to Trump, like, I'm going to come back on your side like I was during your first term and like do all the things that you want me to do in terms of tilting the platform in your direction. And I think the second thing here is that like it's hard to get inside his head and know how deliberate this is or not, but a like upside or an effect of this is going to be playing into this emerging right-wing judicial school of thought on social media regulation that we've talked about before. Mm. Like, John, do you remember like a year ago, the Fifth Circuit Court, that injunction that they... Mm. Right. So this yeah. is a, a like truly unhinged MAGA uh, circuit court judge in Louisiana issued this injunction, which was full of right-wing conspiracy theories, like a really unhinged document that barred the Biden administration from even contacting social media companies to be like, hey, by the way, we saw a post that's medical misinformation. They can't even send them an email, according to this injunction. And the Supreme Court did overrule that, but it was six to three. So it's a little closer than you want. There were three people who said on the Supreme Court that the government should not be allowed to place a phone call to a social media company. Was It, it was Thomas Alito and probably Gorsuch, right? I, yeah, I, I don't was. remember, but I'm sure you're I right. just remember because I have a, a quote here from that. Amy Coney Barrett, in the majority opinion, mm. said she basically like took the Fifth Circuit apart and the, and the federal judge really? and was like, yeah. there's a bunch of misinformation in your ruling. <laughs> and she says the record says nothing about censorship requests. Right. Just there's there's no it. censorship. And that's that's so that's from a conservative Supreme Court justice. Right. But Zuckerberg is now acting like, oh, there was so much pressure to, to censor. I know. The actual thing that happened here was, again, solicited by Meta was just people in the government saying, hey, we are helping you by flagging these posts that we think are misinformation or flagging trends that we're seeing. There was never any like, quote unquote, censor anything pressure from the government, which is a thing that they invent. But I think they see an opportunity here to like feed into this school of thought where like, oh, well, Mark Zuckerberg says they're being pressured to be censored, where they can just move the goalposts on social media regulation back 10 years to like, well, is the government even allowed to contact a social media company? I have, yeah, I have two other interpretations of what Zuckerberg's up to here, um, which are in line with yours. Um, but one, he just wants Meta out of politics. I think that's true. Right? Yeah, right? And when I say out of politics, like obviously he has political ideas of Meta right. and it, it affects politics. Right. But officially, mm -hmm. I think they, whether it's content moderation, whether it's anything else, I think they're like, this whole thing is messy. It's only gotten us in trouble. Right. We're out. And I even think on, on COVID and on medical misinformation, mm -hmm. they thought, okay, well, this isn't politics. Right. <laughs> Shouldn't have been, right? Like right, right. it's right. vaccines are safe. Right. Don't drink bleach, right? Like these are simple. <laughs> they sh shouldn't be politicized. So we will get into this to be helpful, oh, which is right. why they did. Right. And then now looking back, he's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, right. that was political, too. Right. So I've got to get out of that. And they had taken heat years earlier for promoting anti-vaccine misinformation. And that had been like the one big stand that he had been willing to take because like he and his wife were involved in uh, like they fund the local hospital in San Francisco. So the one stand they were comfortable taking is like, we're not going to do anti-vaccine misinformation, which I think was why they went into 2020 saying like, we're going to try to make an effort. Yep. But you're right. The moment it became politicized, they were like, oh, actually, we don't want to be involved in this. And he also, uh, Zuckerberg also said too that you know, back in 2020, the foundation, his foundation, mm -hmm. um, made donations to voting access efforts. Right. Um, very like nonpartisan, whatever. Sure. It has become this conspiracy on the right, right because, you know, the voting access efforts happen to be in like more urban areas. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, of course, the because that's where so, people have not had access. And so that became like Zuckerbucks and suddenly a whole <laughs> lockbox, the lockboxes. Lock yeah. Right. Like basically Trump has said that he like rigged the election. Right. Um, and Zuckerberg says, like, we're going to not do that anymore. That sucks. We're just going to be neutral. Um, he's like, my goal is to be neutral and not play a role one way or the other or to even appear to be playing a role, the billionaire said. So I don't plan on making a similar contribution this cycle. That was from Politico. Um, but but his definition of neutral is whatever whatever the Republicans and the Democrats, it, it's going to get them to not yell at him yes. for being biased. So it's a very easy, like, move the goalposts, work the ref situation. And I think, and, and you made this point, should Trump win again? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he's actually worried about being thrown in jail or not, but if should, <laughs> if should Trump win again and there's a Republican Congress, I do think there's a concern now from some of these tech companies and social right. media companies that actually maybe Republicans could come after them too. Sure. Um, not just on some of these free speech censorship mm -hmm. issues, but on like breaking up meta 
um, right. or you know, some right. of, as the as the Republican Party takes a little bit more mm-hmm. of a or pretends to take more of a populist turn, and they've always been suspicious of Silicon Valley mm-hmm. and tech billionaires anyway. You know, if you're not on the right side of, of their politics, if you're right. not like a Elon Musk, <laughs> um, then I think he wants to hedge his bets that way. Too. Well, this is exactly what happened mm-hmm. during the Trump administration, right? As you remember the like hashtag stop the bias yep. stuff that I don't even remember what triggered it. Oh, I do remember there was a, a news widget on the Facebook homepage. Mm-hmm. It's so stupid. And there would like it came out that there were like a couple of people at Meta who ran this news widget that just had news headlines. And they said, let's remove outright misinformation from it. And like there was a Breitbart link that was just like false. And they said, so let's not have that in there. And this got spun as they're censoring right wing views at Facebook because they're doing thought police and they want to steer our politics, which led into this completely bogus stop the stop the bias campaign that was pushed by like Don Jr. And then Trump picked it up and it became so much stupid over the last several years. Is very a lot of stupid, <laughs> but they put the threat of like the entire regulatory state behind it, and like Trump, who, who was president, was like, "We're going to break up Meta. We're going to do all this stuff to them if they don't stop the bias." So like Meta really leaned into more than any other social media company. I wrote down some of the stuff they did. They um, shut down that news widget when it was Senator John Thune complained. Um, they hosted dinners with right wing media fi- figures like Tucker Carlson and Trump campaign officials to reassure them we're on your side. Uh, they hired prominent right wing lobbyists to be the GOP's men in the room on big content and algorithm decisions, which we know from subsequent leaks, were steered explicitly, explicitly to help Trump. Not like the result happened to help Trump, but they said we have to make these big content algorithm decisions because they would be helpful for Trump. For Trump excuse me. They hired former Senator John Kyle to write up an internal report that was deliberately designed to confirm every right wing conspiracy theory about anti-conservative bias. And this was all came with an implicit promise that they made good on to allow far right lies and misinformation information on the platform to allow election denialism. They wrote the rules specifically around this to allow health disinformation and to tilt the tilt the entire platform towards Trump just in order to appease him to avoid a regulatory threat, which they have done in a number of countries around the world. This is not just a thing they've done in the U.S. And they will absolutely do it again. Well, and one uh, consequence of uh, Zuckerberg's letter already mm-hmm. um, is uh, Trump uh, posted on Truth Social. Zuckerberg admits that the White House pushed to (laughs) suppress Hunter Biden laptop story and much more. In other words, the 2020 presidential election was rigged. Now, there is a problem with that Uh in that uh, Zuckerberg did not admit that the White House pushed to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. He did say that they... They demoted the Hunter Biden laptop story right. in October of 2020. Twitter did and that And you know mostly. who was president in October of 2020? <laughs> Donald Trump. I do remember that, yes. <laughs> so no, yeah. the, Joe Biden, the Biden White House did not pressure right. them to do the Hunter laptop story. I mean, story. there is like uh, the Hunter Biden laptop episode is like an interesting one. And I think that like there is a case to be made that maybe did Twitter specifically go like a little far in down ranking that story, but it was clearly intended as a like make good on spending years of like going way out of their way to yes. let the platform promote like a lot of lies and misinformation. Yeah. And again, the problem is demoting and promoting. That's right. Right. You <laughs> right. just, the just problem, allow that. Yeah. That has nothing to do with free speech. Right. Yeah. All right. Finally, earlier this week, former independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and one-time Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard cemented their support for Donald Trump by accepting senior positions on his hypothetical transition team should he win in November. They're actually honorary (laughs) co-chairs. Wow. Um, So exciting for them. The move marks a significant pivot in both the political careers of RFK Jr., (laughs) a one-time environmental lawyer who was a registered Democrat until late last year, and of Gabbard, who represented Hawaii's second district as a Democrat for eight years. So this gets even weirder and potentially uh, more alarming because since RFK Jr. dropped out, other Mm -hmm. anti-establishment cranks like your Jill Steins, mm-hmm. your Cornell Wests yes. have been tweeting supportively about his challenge to the political establishment. Um, cool. It does seem like all of these politicians, what they have in common is they've gone down internet rabbit holes mm-hmm. um, and they're now joining or at least not opposing a campaign that's trying to win over America's trolls, shit posters, <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> theorists, has most of them. Yeah, Trump, they, Trump they posted a a picture today on Truth Social that, that is like an Avengers picture, <laughs> and it's Trump, J.D. Vance, RFK Jr., Gabbard, Elon, 
Vivek Ramaswamy. He always throws and it was like, this there, is which a is picture so funny. Of, of prominent right. Americans who have online. fallen down internet mm-hmm. rabbit holes and had their brains broken by the internet. And, All of them. And have like no constituency. No. Like Ramaswamy is like, who, who likes that guy? They, you know, it, I do, we talked about this a little bit on Positive America this week. It mm-hmm. is, they are going after the low information voter right. who right. is... Or maybe not. I shouldn't say low information, but just doesn't follow politics that closely. Mm-hmm. Is not getting all of their news from political news sources, but is getting right. information about politics from random podcasts that aren't political podcasts or right. content creators right. or you know your Joe Rogans, your right. Theo Vons. Yeah, it, they have a lot of them are sorry. They are disproportionately younger mm-hmm. male. Um, mm-hmm. They're white males, black males, Latino males, right? right. So it's just it, this, right. these are the people they're going after. Right. And this crew of people is mm-hmm. sort of very in line with that world. Yes. But it is it is striking to see all those faces together and realize that, oh, this is the new coalition that has been created around ultra online politics, which yep. are, as we have talked about many times, like everything we know about social media manipulation, algorithmic incentives, they all point towards anti-system, anti-establishment politics, conspiracism outrage, social distrust, doomerism, the sky is falling, everything, no one is there. coming to help you, the us versus them. All of those are things that add up to a politics that is like, tear down the institutions, you can't trust anybody, tear down the establishment, they're all out to get you, there's a great conspiracy against us. And it's like, I do think it, it is a striking moment that RFK Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard both took like very different paths to that, but both took very online paths to like that kind of politics and like Cornell West kind of like playing footsie with that kind of politics. I think that tells you that when you are playing with anti-system, anti-establishment politics, especially in communities that are extremely online, that is where it tends to lead you. And there's like a lot of reasons that those politics are rising. We talked about it. Of course, it's not just social media. Like there was a big spike in it after the financial crisis. Right. And there's there like- There is massive inequality, right? Like right. all of these- Right. You all see, of these larger trends are real. Yes. And you see wage stagnation that tends to correlate with it. And like wages are up in the U.S., which is maybe part of why you see this like declining a little bit. But institutions have, you know, made huge mistakes and it sometimes failed all across of course. the world. Right. And it happens United everywhere. Right. right. Yes. And I like those aren't politics that are necessarily far right. But in the politics of the United States today, the movement that expresses those politics is Donald Trump. And Par- paranoid right. style of American politics. That's right. Yes. You know, and it's yeah. been around forever. But right. I do think the Internet has supercharged it for all the reasons Absolutely. we've yeah. talked about And here. brings it all together. I think that's also the networking effect of the Internet. If you're like a Tulsi Gabbard person, if you're a Cronulla Wells person or RFK person, the Internet is going to funnel you all to the same place. So it feels very natural to yep. arrive at the Trump coalition. And, you know, the term horseshoe theory. <laughs> have been used to describe people who've gone from like Bernie bro, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and hardcore leftist to MAGA. Right. Um, but like, I don't know if it's as useful because these people haven't gone from believing in like a generous welfare state right. to believing in unregulated <laughs> right. free markets. Right. Nor have they gone from believing that climate change is real mm-hmm. uh, to believing that it's a hoax. Like that's not it. Right. It's it's what they have in common is their healthy skepticism of mm-hmm. government and institutions mm-hmm. has sort of curdled into cynicism, distrust, and, and a outright disbelief. Destroy those institutions. And, and destroy those them institutions. And, them down. and so they're they're more prone to conspiracies. Right. And and they think that the world is out to get them, mm-hmm. it, which is the paranoid part, right? right? right. And right. this is when you think of like the the RFK Jr. conspiracies, mm-hmm. they fit into this category. Yeah. Tulsi Gabbard saying mm-hmm. that like deciding to like stand up for Bashar al-Assad and saying, uh, you know, he didn't actually use chemical weapons on his own people. Like, what is that position? And all the stuff she says seems to be like Russian propaganda. Right. right? Jill Stein as well. Jill Stein too. On that. Right. It starts with a like, it starts with a kernel of truth where it's like, I have some doubts about the benevolence of American foreign policy in the Middle East. Like, right. okay, <laughs> Great. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. But then it gets to a like, well, America says that Bashar al-Assad is bad. And if I'm like at the extreme end of d- distrust, I hate institutions, I don't believe anybody in politics, that must mean Bashar al-Assad is good. And then you see RFK doing the same thing with like... I don't feel good about the pandemic. The government made some mistakes early on. Therefore, the CDC is bad and vaccines are bad. Or like, you know, profit motive drives corporations to do things that hurt people. Sure, sure. And also now they're putting autism in your vaccines. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. And I do think that like, I think your point about it's not 
a horseshoe thing is a good one and is a good one. It's to not left, right. It's up, down. That's right. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want to steal your coinage here because it is a really good one. But I do think that there is a new dividing line that has like been there for a little bit over the last 10 years and is getting much starker in our politics. Yeah. And it's very, it's bad. It's very bad for everyone. It's very bad for everyone. Because I do think that we, we, like it, whether you're a mainstream Democrat or liberal mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you're like center, center right, right, right. Like we are forced to become the defenders of institutions at a mm-hmm. time when anti-institutional sentiment is strong. Right. Even if most of that anti-institutional right. sentiment is healthy right. and not what we're seeing from Trump and his right. gang of goons. But when forced to choose between the people who are going to tear it down and the people who are saying, no, no, everything's fine, everything's Everything wonderful. Good, and right. we, we think everything's wonderful because look right. at us. Right. We're educated and well off and, you know, right. and like, yeah. you, right. so like there is a, there is a challenge there mm-hmm. that if that chasm grows, mm-hmm. then the, the, you know, the trolls and the cranks right. like just build a bigger movement of people who might not believe all of their conspiracies, mm-hmm. but are just pissed. Right. Well, especially if you're going on to TikTok. If you go, if you're reading about or learning about what, something that's happening in politics in the world through TikTok, you're not getting like, well, the government made some good decisions and some bad decisions, and like maybe they made some mistakes, maybe they did some things that I really think are malevolent or bad. But like you see the kind of complete picture, and you see how to like move the needle, mm. or you see maybe like here's a way that we can try to pressure things to move in a direction that I would like more. Like here's a politician who's like halfway to where I would like them to be, so maybe we support them and we get a little bit closer. What TikTok will tell you is that they're all correct. Corrupt. They're all bad. The only person you can listen to is the TikTok influencer who happens to be on your phone at that moment. And we just have to tear it all down and you should hate and distrust everybody, which tells you to disengage. And I like I think these anti-system politics, again, were like like being super online, were helpful for Trump in 2016 because he was the outsider's outsider and he was going up against Hillary Clinton, who was the insider's insider. And there was like there was there was no one at that point, or I should say that there were the case for institutions was not being felt persuasively by people at yes. that point for whatever set of reasons. And so people were very drawn to Donald Trump as the like, I'm going to smash the things you distrust, regardless of whether or not they bought into every aspect of the like hardcore white nationalism. Correct. And I think that that is not working as well for him now. And you see this like the Avengers coalition he's putting together. These are people who are all unpopular. Yeah. And this is also like it's very fractious when you try to have an anti-system coalition. There's a Pew poll of RFK supporters that said that 79 percent of them disapprove of Donald Trump. So like, congratulations yeah. on getting his endorsement. I don't know how helpful that's going to be for you. So trying to cobble something together, especially when you're a former president, is like not helpful. Um, and we should also talk about like there are elements of this in the Democratic coalition, yeah. too. Um, do we want to talk about? Yeah, the AOC I was just going to ask you to bring up the AOC okay. thing. So this this popped uh, uh, Thursday night. Um, as in response to a question that she was doing, I think it was an Instagram live. Was yes. it a live? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or not uh, an Instagram, or, or just, uh, just a um, a Q and A on Instagram. Okay, a Q and A Instagram. Uh, she got a question from someone: Why do leftists attack you despite multiple Palestinian rights groups saying you are one of Congress's best? And this also came after she just got confronted again at a restaurant by an activist who was shouting at her to say, "Why won't you say genocide?" Which she has said. Right. Which is um, kind of tells you a lot. Um, And her response was to acknowledge the legitimacy of criticizing her and saying, look, I'm in the government, so it's fair to hold me account. And it's like it's all the things you expect her to say. Um, But then she she took, I feel, a like stronger position that she has in the past on this quote. There's a lot of disinformation going around. Quote, there's a lot of disinformation going around. A lot of people are getting news from random viral social media posts. Disinformation hurts movements from the inside, discredits them from the outside. It's important to check. It's everywhere. It's easier to be pissed off on the Internet than actually build community and power around a just cause. So I feel like this is the kind of long awaited confrontation, honestly. I also think she she just like summed up all the different threads of our she just pulled together all the different threads yes. of our episode right. here. That's what I'm telling you. Uh, OSC coming offline. I <laughs> I saw that I tweeted about it because I was like, I think she, this is the the best lesson uh, mm-hmm. about politics and about organizing right. that like you have to be effective and to be effective you have to persuade people and to persuade people you have to right. show them empathy and grace and right. not just be mad on the internet. Sure. Which Barack Obama, going back to that speech, <laughs> that's what he was saying, right, right. in that right. speech. And, like, Barack Obama's politics, very different than AOC's politics. Mm-hmm. But the common thread there is people who 
understand what politics and, right. and change and organizing actually mm -hmm. requires of you and mm -hmm. what the internet tells us it requires of you, which right. is just like yelling, yelling dunking, right. owning libs, mm -hmm. being right and having mm -hmm. that be enough, right. getting the retweets, getting the engagement, right. spreading the rumors about, you know, mm -hmm. Beyonce and Taylor so you can get more followers, right? Like this right. is right. I mean, that's why you that's why you go yell at AOC who is the person who most agrees with you instead of yelling at one of the Democrats who most disagrees with you or, God forbid, one of the Republicans right. who wants to take things even further is because that's how you show that you're the most righteous, you're the most moral, you're one of the good ones. And if you have to lie in the process and say she never said genocide or misrepresent her position, then, you know, whatever. It's all for the likes. It's all in the game. Right. And if you and if you're the one who took down AOC in some viral moment <laughs> then like maybe it can make you sleep better at night because right. you feel like mm, I'm on my moral high horse now i got it right i do think that this is a a illustration of the fact that like social media driven anti-system politics like they're not good for any political party they're hard but they sit especially uncomfortably within the democratic party and the democratic coalition yes. right now and it's like very hard to make that fit and i because think because we are the we are a party <laughs> of like doing trying things. to make institutions work right and trying to prove to voters right. that a, a government mm -hmm. of the people can actually deliver right. and and it can function well right. and it is better than the alternative which is ruled by force. Right, right, right. Yes, I mean right, it's both the authoritarianism of the Republican Party and also Republicans they don't they don't like to pass legislation. They yeah. want to roll things back. They want to, they want institutions to not work. They want to shrink the federal government. Mm -hmm. Democratic Party wants to actually try to do things, which is why you need more consensus the idea that government doing things can be good. Um, and I think this like the like anti-system social media politics have been like we've very much been feeling them within the Democratic Party over the last year. Now, there were some good reasons to be, I mm -hmm. think, a little bit upset with where yeah. things were going for sure. And I think that there's like a feeling right now in this moment that that has been kind of on pause, that like we're all in the same team right now because we're all coconut pilled and we're all coming together. <laughs> and I think that this is a reminder that like that pause is temporary. And this is going to come it's back. All this still is still there. Right. The it's surface. still there. And I think that like something tricky for the Harris Walls campaign is going to be figuring out how to continue to ride that social media energy, which they've been doing so well, but not getting captured by it. Yes. And to like figure no, it's, out. Th it's, it's basically my biggest fear around mm -hmm. the election. Right. Right. Like right. and it, you wonder if the polls capture it, too. Right. Which mm -hmm. is like there is this there are these very disengaged, disaffected. Right. Americans right. who are vulnerable to this kind of appeal. Right. The, the and, kind of misinformation and, of it. You know, if you asked me to bet, I would say there's not enough of, of them or maybe they won't mm -hmm. vote and so it's going to be okay right. or they've already right. accounted for they've been Trump voters for a while. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I think. Mm -hmm. But if we were to wake up surprised, right. <laughs> you know, I would say that that's probably what's causing it. Right. Because it doesn't. The, the worst effect of it is not someone believes that AOC has a slightly less good position on Gaza than she actually has. The, the, the worst outcome here is that people are made to feel more cynical than they should be yes. about politics and made to feel that it doesn't matter and all the parties are bad. And even the people in the Democratic Party who are young and exciting and progressive, they're fake progressives and we shouldn't support them. And so I'm not even I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to volunteer. And that is dangerous. Yeah. Which will also be, by the way, I think Trump's strategy at this debate and for the rest of the campaign. Absolutely. Right? right. He just wants people to believe like, oh, you like her? She's full of shit. She's full of shit just like me, but I own it. Right. right. I mean, that's, that's, that's his message. That's the strategy has always been to get people to get people to not vote, make it hard to vote. That's why he doesn't want the Zuckerberg lockboxes, which I still don't know I still what don't that know what is. They are, yeah, no. I don't know what the lockbox is. Anyway, <laughs> maybe he'll send us one. <laughs> Would love a lockbox. Um, but yeah, no. So you know, be wary of anti-system politics, and mm -hmm. that's why you uh, got to go out and uh, volunteer in Re this election. Remember that there was a reason that you were really excited. Yes. If you if you start to feel that waning, like, look, it's good to don't put don't have blinders on. Like, accountability is great. Be involved in like pushing the party too but like remember there was a reason that that felt really really good and exciting because it is great note to end on um all right max well i'll talk to you next week everyone have a great weekend have a great weekend